Hi, I'm David Davis from Actual Tech Media. Excited to be here at the headquarters of HashiCorp. I'm joined by Mr. Chris Kent. He is a senior product marketing manager. How are you doing, Chris? I'm doing well. How are you? Thank you for having me. Yeah, thanks for being on. So this is really exciting for me. I'm a big fan of what you all are doing here at HashiCorp. And I understand there's some new announcements that you want to talk to us about. And we're going to do a little bit of whiteboarding, right? Yeah. Yeah, okay. so this, this week uh, we, we announced uh, some new features around our console product, uh, which is really exciting for us as a company. Um, and it really kind of helps address a kind of a growing pain point that companies are having while moving to this uh, kind of a dynamic infrastructure world. Um, and so the idea being that, and I'll, I'll just kind of start mapping it out here, but the idea being that in the world where you have, let's say, a web server that lives in you know, a data center over here, um, and then you also have a, d a database that lives in a different data center. Um, this is a new move just by itself, right? Mm -hmm. So the idea being that this all used to kind of live in the same kind of trusted network on either the same device uh, or within the same data center. But while you're separating these out, um, the, the kind of the, the monolithic way or the, the historical way of doing this is that you say, okay, so web, web server has IP1 database has IP2, and then you map that out, and it's a, a kind of a logical flow. Okay. The, the problem that this creates is that if you, if you try to scale this up um, and you add, let's say, five more servers, then you then have to map out that, those five new servers to that database, or likewise, with the, the, if you want to scale up your database, you're going to have to map out that flow. So what, uh, what we wanted to do was we wanted to say, as traffic is coming in through, let's say, a, a firewall or a load balancer, um, we wanted to be able to kind of route the traffic appropriately based on uh, kind of mapping that you can define. Mm -hmm. So the idea, the idea being that we would want to say, instead of like going from the IP level, that we would go into a more granular view to where we say web should be able to talk to DB. So with console, we've created this thing called uh, service segmentation, which allows for you to segment uh, through a, a service uh, mesh graph, the, the idea being that I want to map out this relationship. And would you call these kind of like tags, or are these almost like tags for? Yeah, essentially, <laughs> like you're, you're, you're kind of having an identity based on what the, the service is. Um, and so what you're doing through console is you're saying, I want to create a certificate that will then identify this service as web. Okay. Um, and then I want to identify this service as data, uh, database. So I'm going to do that again through a certificate that says this is my identity. And then what we're going to do is through, let's say, we're going to have a proxy that lives on here, right? And we're going to have a proxy that lives on here. And that the traffic is going to actually get requested through these two proxies to each other, and they're going to self-identify themselves to each other. Hmm. Console will manage the relationship between them and say, yes, web can talk to DB, or DB, you know, let's say, uh, we also want to say that uh, DB cannot talk to, um, to web. So the idea being there is that we want to be able to, whether it's uh, like either one way or bi-directional, we want to say that what the relationship can and can't do. So what this does is it allows us to basically scale in this massive way without ever actually having to change the rules. So if we say we're going to scale this up to, to handle load and we're going to add 100 more web nodes and we're going to add five more database nodes, the rules still stay the same. And for every one of these web nodes that you bring up, let's say that they were containers from an image, they all have that label of web. You don't have to go in and manually configure the IP addresses or DNS or anything Correct. like this that. Correct. This is all handled programmatically. So um, whether you're doing it through like Terraform to create a new VM somewhere, you're using Nomad or Kubernetes or whatever it is to do like container orchestration, like, mm -hmm. yeah, same thing. Like, okay. you're saying that this is what it is. Mm -hmm. you're, you're identifying it through its own kind of, again, through its own certificate to where, you know, what may be in a kind of a, the historical way, like the IP1 to IP2, I mean, that would have created 500 rules, right? right. So right. this, it still maintains the one, so uh, you can kind of scale indefinitely without having to rewrite or store all these different kind of pieces. Is there also a security aspect to this? Yeah, so um, through 
the certificate and the identity, we use a, CL, a TLS. So yeah. what that means is that not only are we providing the, the identity capability, but we're also encrypting the, the, the communication between these two. Oh, very nice. Which is especially important if these are at different data centers like you drew out here. Exactly. So that's the idea with, like, as companies are kind of uh, wanting to eliminate that single point of failure or, like, vendor lock-in, the idea being that in this kind of a world, when no matter where you are, you can just very simply through console kind of establish what the relationships are and then permit that to kind of permeate throughout your entire infrastructure. So do I no longer need a firewall or a virtual firewall between these two? Can it sort of... Between these two, you definitely don't, don't in this kind of a scenario because in this way, you're actually just managing um, what the relationship's allowed to happen. Okay. So if this rule exists, then you can talk if, you know, whatever X versus DB it is. So it could be any other service you have out there, any other traffic, you could say, nope, it's not allowed. Okay. And by default, it allows you to just kind of map that out. So the nice thing about that is because you're talking through the proxies, like mm -hmm. the, the traffic is very regulated. And this also, just to clarify, there is, uh, it's also natively available. Okay. This, however, gives you a faster kind of road to adoption. So you don't have to actually touch your application code or anything like that. This allows you to just kind of put it on and go st get started. Um, with the native, you can definitely do that, which has the native implementation, but then you're obviously augmenting what your, your original application code was. So. Okay. And then what about, say there's, you know, you spun up 100 web servers here. Obviously, there's clients that are trying to gain access to those web servers. Is there a load balancer in this picture? Can console help with load balancing? Um, well, it depends on, I mean, there's, there's a ton of different ways to kind of solve that. There are, you know, load balancers. The, the problem is that, in this scenario, a lot of the, like, let's say you're in, this is in uh, AWS, mm -hmm. and then this is in, uh, let's say, Azure, and then you have maybe another one in GCP. So the idea being that those networks are actually controlled by those clouds. Oh, okay. So, like, we're, you're kind of abstracting away that the ability to, to granularly manage their network. So you're saying, I want to actually protect it on a more granular level mm -hmm. than relying on someone else's, uh, you know, kind of inherently not as trustworthy network. So, okay. so the idea being that, yes, it could live there, but the idea being that we actually want to do it on, on, a, on a service level, not on a different level from that standpoint. Right, okay. So these are some new features in the latest revision? Yes, and this is all open source, which is exciting for us. So we, uh, we announced it a couple days ago, and it's, it's readily available, and people are, are using it as of right now. So Very cool. And so if I want to try this out or, or get a demo, what do you recommend? Yeah, so go to console.io, um, and that way you can immediately start using uh, the open source version of this. And if you are looking for more of like the enterprise offering, um, there's also a way to reach out to us, and, and we can walk you through either a proof of concept or some way of working with you. Very cool. I'm going to try it out for myself. Thank you, Chris. Of course. Thanks for having me. <laughs>